tonight is sort of basically tell a story for how it came to be that these large transnational corporations have basically become the most dominant institutions on the planet and why that has happened and what we can do about it. So in order to tell that story, I'm going to actually cover four basic concepts this evening. The first one is the word democracy. That word gets tossed around a lot, right? So in order to get some real clarity here, I'm going to ask people, what language is this from? Greek, very good. So let's break it down. Let's define it. The word demos means? People. The people. And kratia? Rule. Rule. That's a, that's a good crowd. Way to go. I'm, I'm proud of it. <laughs> the people rule. That's what the word means. So here's the question. How many people believe that we the people are ruling in the United States? Don't be shy. Come on, pop those hands up. Look around. Not a single person raised your hand. And you know why? Because we know it's not true. Because the reality is that to actually rule in a society would mean that you were meaningfully participating in making the decisions that actually affect our lives. And yes, there are ways that we can exercise power. Yes, there are ways that we could begin to govern. But for the most part, structurally, we're not able to actually make these big decisions. In fact, I'll suggest this to you that the problem has to do with the next concept, which is sovereignty. Anybody give me a couple of word definition of sovereignty? Or how about this? What if I instead just had the word sovereign? What would you think of? A king. Exactly, the king. And you know why? Because the word sovereignty means authority to rule. And only 400 or 500 years ago, it was synonymous. To, have, to be the king was to have ultimate authority to rule. And when I say ultimate authority, where did the king claim his authority? God. You don't get more legitimate. I mean, seriously. If you can actually assert that your right to rule comes from on high and if everybody else believes it, that's pretty powerful. In fact, to really illustrate that point, let's do a little exercise together. This is always a lot of fun for me. <laughs> And you'll see, I'm going to invite this entire congregation to close your eyes and repeat after me. David Cobb is the king. David Cobb is the king. And as the king, he is God's representative on earth. And as the king, he is God's representative on earth. And therefore, everything David Cobb says must be obeyed. <laughs> okay, you can open your eyes. Okay, a couple of things to observe here. Uh, first is that all of you chuckled at that, right? When you first started. This, the brother standing up who told us about the commercial workers. What's your name, brother? Matt. Pat. Matt. Pat and Matt with a demo. Matt refused to do it. He wouldn't, he wouldn't even play along. In fact, Matt, who had been listening very attentively and very respectfully when I was doing that, gave me one of these looks. <laughs> he would not even do it. Many of you actually gave me that look a little bit. Sheila wouldn't do it. She actually, she looked like she might be sucking on a lemon all of a sudden. She'd been smiling and being very nice to me. And then when I did this little exercise, she went. And all of you actually laughed at it, right? I mean, everybody kind of chuckled at that. And you know why? Because it's kind of funny. It's, and in fact, it's, it, the word is absurd. It's absurd. So there's a certain laughter to it. There's a certain humor to it. To think that I would be able to actually tell each one of you how to live your lives. Or even better, that I, simply because of who my parents are, should be able to say how all of society should operate. Of course that's absurd. That's ridiculous. Of course we should laugh at it. And 500 years ago, human beings just like you not only said it, but they believed it. And if they didn't believe it, they didn't dare to say it out loud. And the reason that I want to say that and really drive that point home is to consider this. I'm a Green Party member and proud of it. And I work with Greens. I also work with progressive Democrats. I work with principled Republicans on issues. I work with socialists. I work with anarchists. You know what? I've never met a monarchist in the United States of America. And by that I mean we can't even wrap our heads around the idea of monarchy. And only 500 years ago, which is a blip in time really, in terms of the big picture of history, people could not even wrap their heads around anything other than the divine right of kings. 
So when people tell me, oh, David, you're just being naive when you talk about a world where U.S. foreign policy will not be based on war. Uh, when you say that you'd like to have a health care system that's based on access to health care as a fundamental human right instead of a commodity to be bought and paid for at a profit. When you say that you want to actually dismantle white supremacy. When you say that you'd like to actually live in a world where we transition off of our addiction to oil and coal and other fossil fuels. That's just dreaming. You, that's dreaming. We can never make those kind of changes. I'm like, I, are you kidding me? Are you not been paying attention throughout human history? The reality is that profound changes have been made by people just like us. And it only happens if enough people are willing to think differently. And here's the kicker, y'all. And the Texan going to get a little metaphysical on y'all, so hold still. <laughs> we are all individually participating in creating the, creative, the collective reality that we're experiencing. Right? We are all participating. And that, another way to say it, if enough people think that something is true, if enough people act like it's true, it will be true. We can create a different reality. But what we have to do is start to change. And I think that that's incredibly important. Because frankly, I don't think enough of us are actually acting like we're sovereign people. That's the problem. And in fact, that'll take me to the next topic that I want to make sure that we cover. And that is legal personhood. You'll notice I didn't put corporate personhood because actually it's the concept of legal personhood I want to cover. And what legal personhood means is the ability to assert rights under law. If you are a legal person, it means that you have the ability to assert rights under law. That's a very profound concept. And the last concept that I want to make sure we cover is corporation. Now, it's interesting because in some respects, it's the last concept because it's the least important concept. Because what if the problem isn't really with corporations per se, but the problem is with us? What if the real problem is how we're thinking and acting? What if the problem is amongst ourselves that we're not willing to actually assert our authority to rule, that we're not actually asserting our rights under law? What if the problem is really with us as a collective people? And that kind of makes sense. And then I say, Kyle, what are you talking about? Of course the problem is with the corporations. Because you know what? Look, I don't even talk about corporate power anymore. Because you know, you know why? Because corporations are not merely exercising power today. They are ruling us. They are making the fundamental public policy decisions that affect our lives. The reality is it's unelected and unaccountable corporate CEOs who are making the decisions about how much poison will be spewed into the air that we are all collectively breathing. Corporate CEOs are making the decisions about how much poison will be in the water that we're all drinking. Corporate CEOs are making the decision about what transportation choices will be available to us as members of this society. Corporate CEOs are making decisions about whether this country goes to war or not. In fact, as a quick illustration, here's a pop quiz question. How many people here are eating genetically modified foods on a daily basis? Say it louder. All of us. All of us should raise our hands to that question. And you know why? Because you can't help it. Because genetically modified organisms have been placed into the public food supply. And so, here's a question. Who made that public decision to put GMOs into the public food supply? Monsanto Corporation. Archer Daniels Midland Corporation. Cargill Corporation. Unelected and unaccountable corporate CEOs made these decisions that are clearly public decisions but they made them behind closed doors. And they claimed, in fact, that these were private decisions. They're private corporate decisions. So we the people didn't, not only did we not know, not only were we not allowed to participate in any meaningful way in these decisions, we didn't even know they were being made. And then after the fact that FDA got involved, and then frankly, after the fact, some righteous, courageous citizen activists began to organize in this country. But it's worth asking, do you know what U.S. activists, the big battle cry around GMOs are? Label. Label it. Label it. Then now let me ask you, do y'all know what the battle cry is in Latin America, in Europe, and in Africa? 
Say it louder. Get rid of it. Bam. Do you see the difference? The difference between just trying to accept that it's happened, that just at least let us know so we can make a consumer choice versus ban it. We don't want it at all. What I'm suggesting to you folks is that the, enti like, the entire GMO fight is indicative of how we as a people have been trained to react. And I say this very carefully, and not only as a North American, but as a white North American, I know that I, and I believe that we collectively, have a hell of a lot to learn from the Global South. Our sisters and brothers in the Global South are way further advanced than we are. They are so much further along than we are about how to react to corporate power and corporate rule. And so, I think that corporation, the word corporation is profoundly important, and so I'll do the same thing. What language is the word corporation from? It's from Latin. Can we break that down? Corpus means body. the body, and here's extra credit for my Latin scholars. T-I-O-N, the suffix means? The, you know, that's right, to make or to have. So really the word corporation, when you break it down, is to give or already have the quality of a body. What? It literally means to create a body or to create it. And you know why? It's important. And let me ask, is there any lawyers in the crowd besides me that would be willing to admit it? There's a hand. There's a, you're, already, you're, already, you're already on the hook, brother. What's your first name? Rich. Rich. Rich, do you remember in law school, uh, in corporations class, this statement? A corporation is a legal fiction. Does that ring a bell? Good for you. A people's lawyer. <laughs> He, was, he wasn't as indoctrinated as I am. But let me ask, has anybody heard that phrase, a corporation is a legal fiction? All right, I see several hands. Uh, you know why? Uh, let me ask you this. So a corporation is a legal fiction. What does the word fiction mean? No. Not true. A corporation is not true. It doesn't exist. So we're taught in law school, it doesn't really exist, but we're going to pretend like it exists under law so we can treat this conglomeration of people and contracts and resources and material and money. We're going to pretend like it's one thing. And if enough people think that something is true, if enough people act like it's true, it's true. And in fact, that's exactly how it operated. So just... It, just as I was taught that a corporation is a legal fiction, but we pretend like it's true, so too is that the creation of the original corporation. And in fact, the word corporation is from Latin because the first corporations that we would really think of and understand uh, actually come out of the Roman Republic. Not the Roman Empire, by the way. And sometimes I wish that we had enough time in these meetings to really ask ourselves, what happens when a republic devolves into an empire? Because that might be an important conversation in the United States today. Right? It might be very important. Maybe, maybe Scott, that might be a good third Thursday conversation. 